What's up, friends? Welcome to Web3 Academy, a place for entrepreneurs, creators, and marketers to explore and learn how to use Web3 to transform business models and create thriving communities. Enjoy this next episode. Welcome to Web3 Academy. GM, Kyle, GM, everybody. What's up? It's Thursday, and it is the weekly roll-up where we break down all the news in Web3 and Wow, what a week it's been. Uh, we got so much to get through today. Uh, we had April Fool's Day. Uh, we got some stuff going on in the payment uh, layer and integrations uh, with making payment much easier in Web3, which is great to onboard more people. Uh, we got some big news over uh, at Twitter with uh, Elon, uh, which I'm sure many of you have seen already. We're going to dive into that. Uh, we got some... Um, Exciting news on the government level, some uh, actually positive news coming from some governments, which is great to see. Uh, and uh, then we're going to wrap up with the DAO of the month today. Uh, and we got a DAO that we're super excited to be highlighting, uh, one of the OG DAOs to tease that a little bit. Uh, so, uh, but before we jump in, um, as always, uh, I'm Jay Hamilton coming at you from Whistler, Canada, uh, where I am a... Uh, Web3 uh, builder, entrepreneur, and uh, a marketer in the Web2 world. Uh, and as always, I'm joined by my bro, my buddy. You know what? Not as always, because last week I wasn't here. True. You were actually joined True. by Jeremy last week. Uh, but I'm happy to be back. I am back in Popoyo, Nicaragua. And uh, I'm excited to be back on the show this week. So before we start, what are you grateful for today, Kyle? I am grateful for uh, my friends, Boogs and Jenny, uh, longtime friends, uh, like since I was a child, and uh, they came and visited me in Nicaragua. This is why I was away the last week. So we had a little bit of a vacation. I took a little couple days off work, uh, and, uh, and we spent some time cruising around Nicaragua. It was a great week. Great to see friends from back home, uh, which as a nomad, you don't get to see very often. So uh, yeah, very grateful for them and just glad they came, came down to visit. Nice. How about you? Boogs has just got one of the best nicknames of all times. Yeah. Um, I am grateful for uh, my desk. Uh, I purchased a new standing desk, uh, which nice. uh, uh, has given me the ability to move my body during the day, uh, which is very nice when uh, you, like so many of us, sit at a computer all day. So grateful you look for look like you're sitting right now, though. I am sitting right now because my back hurts. <laughs> Uh, because apparently at the same time, I'm also an old man and I injured my back while bending down in the bathroom this morning. So we don't need to get into the details of that. <laughs> uh, I, we always like to start with, uh, the web three word of the week. Kai, what's the web three word of the week this week? The web three word of the week is, is utility. Um, and the reason I say utility is the more that for me, anyway, the more that I go down this rabbit hole of Web3 and speak with more people in Web3, I keep realizing all the different um, utility that Web3 enables. Uh, it can just, it can do so much. And I think we've only scratched the surface in Web3. And I think over the coming years, we're going to just see so much new utility coming out of this. And, and that really excites me. And that's honestly the point in this podcast is we try to stay away from the markets and the prices and try to look at like, how do we actually use these things to better communities, to better businesses um, and to um, create more equality around the world. And um, so you, utility is the, is the word of the, the week. I love that. I love that because you nailed it with that's the objective of, of us here on that pod on this podcast is really exploring the various utility that web three enables and you just there's we're just scratching the surface so uh and, I, and we're going to talk about some utility today as always yes, sir uh but let's start with some fun it was april fools this past week i mean we're almost a week out from uh, april 1st at this point but uh there was uh there was some fun had on april fools april fools is a dangerous time in the crypto <laughs> world if you're if you're not in crypto twitter <laughs> deep in crypto, twitter just stay away on april 1st there's <laughs> There's just uh, there's too much fun being had and you need to be on the know because otherwise you <laughs> you might miss something or think something's real when it's not. Yeah. Um, but our first story here uh, is that Bankless 
purchased the rights to Wells Fargo Arena. So the Philadelphia Flyers and the Philadelphia 76ers used to play at Wells Fargo Arena, but they're now going to play at Bankless Arena uh, after a $420 million crypto, uh, or sorry, deal was approved. Uh, and one of the best parts of the, this, uh, this story, and I actually have to say, where I first saw this story was in uh, a Discord server that I'm in, the Jump server, which is a great server for marketers. Uh, and a guy posted it as real news in, <laughs> in, in their Discord server. And so he clearly got he clearly got fooled, uh, which I was sort of surprised because if you read the story, you can tell this isn't real right away. But this is the best, the best, my favorite line from this is Bankless will reportedly trade sixty nine hundred sorry, sixty nine thousand Ethereum tokens and an undisclosed amount of board ape yacht NFTs, turtle <laughs> NFTs and David's crypto punk via pseudo swap, according to the reporter. <laughs> you, you know, it's not true because they used all the meme numbers, $420 million deal, 69,000 Ethereum. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I love it. What's funny though is so Bankless is, uh, has been a client of ours and we've been working with to help them with marketing and growth for I don't know, a year and a half now at least. And they did this last year as well, um, but they did a different one. So they last year they for April Fools, they put out a newsletter and said that Wells Fargo acquired Bankless. And, uh, and it was actually so many people believed it uh, to the point that their subscriber base had a significant decrease that day, like hundreds of subscribers unsubscribed from Bankless because they thought that, well, they actually like gave it and, and got bought out by Wells Fargo. So it was actually quite detrimental. Uh, this one, we didn't see any impact, uh, thankfully, uh, on a bad side anyway. So um, yeah, great, great April Fool's joke. Good job, Ryan and David. All right, sticking with the April Fool's trend, what else have we got here? So this one was kind of funny. I actually thought this one was, this was the first <laughs> April Fool's joke that I saw that day and I thought it was real and it was breaking Solana to shut down its consensus layer and settle on Ethereum. And for some reason, the reason I thought it was real is Anatoly, the, the founder of, of Solana retweeted this and I was like, holy shit, they're doing it. And the reason it's kind of funny for me is like, a lot of people, in the, especially in the Ethereum space, talk about this. It's like Ethereum is going to be the settlement layer of the world. Um, these other more centralized chains, like they don't have that decentralization. But if they wanted to, they could actually just execute their consensus on Ethereum. And so there's talk like this is probably going to happen for some of the chains. And I was like, holy shit, it's happening with Solana. That's the first one. Uh, but yeah, just an April Fool's joke. But what was nice is it was played on by the Solana crew as well. So respect. Okay, next one we got here is uh, somebody on Twitter tweeted uh, a, an image of a role at the US Department of State saying that they were hiring an ambassador to the metaverse uh, for, for, for somewhere between $143,000 to $173,000 a year, uh, which they are clearly not hiring this role. This is not a real role. Uh, I take that. But it would it would be nice if they did. I was going to say, I think they would get a lot of, they would get a lot of applications from a lot of very bright people, I think. Yeah, um, I agreed. And, and this guy, I just love what he says. He says, if selected, I will work to build lasting peace with the metaverse, <laughs> uh, which is, which is, you know, I, I just got to touch on this quick guy. And I'm sure you feel the same is um, it's so, I've never felt before such a difference between being in a community, so being part of the crypto Web3 community versus being out of the community. And anytime I go out of the community to talk to friends or family members, it's unbelievable to me how negative their view of Web3 and crypto, crypto in particular over Web3, how negative their view is. And there's so much fear and so much scare around it. Um, and so it's just, it's really nice to see somebody point out that like, really, we're all just trying to make the world a better place here, right? right? right. Uh, so great, There's great. There's a huge disconnect from those who understand huge. Web3 to those who don't. Like it's, it's, it's massive. Huge. It's completely huge. different worlds. Yeah. It's kind of hard and, to go and sit with my family or friends who are not in this space and have a conversation because I'm like, I just want to talk about Web3. And they're like, I don't even know what that means. I'm like, shit, what do you guys want to talk about then? But, but okay, let me, let me just back that up a little bit because I was, I was just going to say something that is sort of the opposite of what you just said, Kai. Um, Kyle and I's DMs are open. We're in our Discord server, Web3 Academy. We, are, well, we welcome anybody to ask us questions right. because um, we do need 
uh, we need more openness. And if you are new to this space, please reach out. We'd love to chat with you. Uh, there's so many beautiful things happening that are going to make the world a better place. This is not just about making money. 100%. Okay, next up, uh, we got big news out of OpenSea. Uh, so OpenSea, which is the largest NFT platform in the world, uh, about 1.4 million users uh, on their platform, has now announced that you will no longer need crypto to buy NFTs on the platform. You will be able to use uh, Visa, MasterCard, American Express, as well as Apple Pay. Uh, and obviously, this is big news because there's a lot of people who don't have digital wallets yet, don't have crypto, and aren't able to participate in this NFT boom uh, and buy NFTs. And so um, great, great news for onboarding more users into the NFT space. Yeah, I don't really know how it works like under the hood, but it is interesting because mm -hmm. it's like it's onboarding people into crypto and they don't even really realize it, right? Because it's like you can buy some NFT with your visa for, let's say, $2,000, and then you can go and sell that NFT for ETH. Uh, and now you have crypto in your wallet and you never really like you never use an, uh, like a centralized exchange. I, I mean, I'm sure the, the way that you're buying this with visa and everything is obviously centralized. Um, but yeah, that's, that's very interesting to me. I don't know how it's going to play out, but, um, cool. Uh, I, I think the funny part is when you're buying an NFT, that's expensive for like two ETH, it doesn't sound or seem that expensive. And then when you convert that into us dollars and now you got to buy it and it's like, I don't know, $8,000. It's like, Oh shit, this kind of sucks. So we'll see how that plays out. Yeah. It is funny how those of us in, in the web three space start to think in ETH and not in us dollars. It's a, right. a a transition you got to make and calculate that in your head. Okay, next up, uh, we got another sort of on the same thread of uh, payment. Um, and that is that Apple Pay is integrating with uh, one of the most popular crypto wallets, MetaMask. And, and this is big news because again, it's going to allow more users to onboard to crypto uh, because you don't you can just make a much easier easier transition using your apple pay wallet which obviously um i don't actually know how many people out have apple pay wallets but you know billion people <laughs> yeah, it's a lot now it's only 400 dollars. is you're yes. allowed to do i don't know if it's per day yep. or 400 dollars a month or whatever yep. which seems like yes that's small um but the real benefit to this is um in my, my opinion anyway is Think about like gaming when that takes off and you have gaming NFTs and like things that you use in gaming with tokens and that they're small microtransactions. So you don't need a lot of money. Things we do now in crypto are like buying big expensive PFP NFTs and like DeFi where you're putting your savings into something. That's not what this is. This utility is for. This is more for like the small microtransactions to, to like play Axie Infinity or to play whatever game is in the crypto space. You need to fill up your wallet with a little bit of ETH just to play. This allows you to do that. And so this allows um, the, the more mainstream people to come in and just do the things that they want to do without really thinking too much about crypto. It's more like, oh, Apple pay to fund my wallet and then boom, I'm able to play this game. That's the key thing. And then they can start earning crypto or earning NFTs mm -hmm. as they play. That's really what this enables. It doesn't enable like the whales to come in, you know, buy whatever tokens or whatever, but who cares about that? I don't really care about that. It's like this enables a bunch of people to get onboarded easily to mm -hmm. then go and do the things they want to do. Maybe it's participate in like a new social app or it's a game or whatever. Um, so that I think is, is really, really cool. Yeah. And I think for a lot of people too, their first transaction is probably under $400, right? Like most people looking to get into the space, they want to, they want to put in $10 or a hundred dollars. And this is what we always suggest, right? Is, you know, you don't need to, I think there's this big belief that like, Oh, if I'm getting into the space, I need to be investing thousands of dollars. No, like, jump in, spend 10, spend 50, spend hundred, spend whatever you're comfortable with and just play and try. Well, and I, I think we're, we're, it seems like we're finally reaching that phase and I don't know that we're there yet, but we're getting there where ever since I've been in crypto, it's been about investing, right? The last yeah. however many years, it's all been about, I want to get in because, you know, I, yes, I'm here for the tech, some people, but it's, I want to make money. So it's, we're, we're dollar cost averaging. We're putting in a bunch of money and we're, we're hoping to go to the moon kind of thing. I think now with games and social and all the things that are coming with Web3, 
it's not about that anymore. Now it's like, I want to participate. I want to play. I want to, um, I want to do right. Like I want to actually like be involved. I want to create, et cetera. And so it's, it's, we're getting away from just the investing crowd and we're getting into the real utility and the, in the actual users, um, of this whole thing, which is super exciting. Uh, and I don't know how long it's going to take for that to actually play out where it's just real users, not investors. Um, but that's when we know, like we've kind of past that threshold and we're, we're, we've really made it in web three, you know? Yeah. Um, so that's, yeah. that excites me. Yeah. And that's a great lead in to our next story here, which is uh, a highlight on um, things that you can do in the real world and get paid in digital tokens. Uh, and there's been a bunch of projects that we've seen um, over the past few weeks, one of which we actually uh, had on the podcast on Tuesday this week. Um, but let me tell you about these Four, four examples of projects um, that you can get paid in tokens. Uh, so one is called Hive Mapper. Hive Mapper is building new Google Maps. And they're doing that by having normal people like you or I, uh, we put a dash cam on our car and we drive around our city and we earn tokens by doing it. Um, so right now, Google Maps spent millions of dollars um, to map the streets and to create Google Maps. Um, but Hive Mappers is going to create that by incentivizing us to do it. Um, you know, you need your own camera and you've got to have the, the setup, which I haven't looked into the hardware to do that. Um, but my guess is a lot of people already have these, these hardwares. Um, and they just raised $18 million from Multicoin uh, to get started on this plant. So uh, I think that's a, you know, it's great to see the simplicity of something anybody could do and get paid in tokens. Um, the next one is Step In. Uh, this one, I saw this one like a few weeks ago and I was like, really? Uh, I haven't, I have not gotten involved, but basically this is as simple as like you get paid to walk and run outside. Um, so you buy a pair of NFT shoes and then every day there is a period where you can use, use your NFT shoes, but you have to actually go for a walk or a run and it tracks you and if you move during that period then you get tokens uh so really really interesting social fitness game basically love that uh the next one is helium uh, and helium lets you earn money by putting a internet router in your house uh, that others can connect to so you're basically like you're buying a mini hotspot and you get paid in helium tokens when others connect to it uh, and Helium's already got over 500,000 routers in 47,000 cities, uh, and they've raised over $200 million to basically build the decentralized wireless network. Um, right now, Helium is just limited to IoT products, so you're not able to connect your phone. It's not 5G. This is not um, the typical internet that we would use or think about. Uh, but they they are planning to roll that out in the future as well. And this is who we just had on our podcast um, with Ada. And, and actually, um, I think it's 700. Didn't she say on the podcast that it was 750,000 routers now? You're so right. It's, You're it's, right. it's growing a lot, she said, too. Um, but yeah, the 5G part is coming. But yeah, Helium is very interesting. That's a cool, cool model. Uh, and the last one is super local. And with super local, you can get paid to check in. Uh, at your favorite locations. Uh, I'm sure those of us might remember from Web2, one of the popular platforms early was Foursquare. Uh, and basically, Superlocal is building the new Foursquare. So you simply, you take a picture, you put a caption, you submit it on the app, and then you earn tokens. Um, and they're, they're looking to build that, uh, yeah, that super local platform that can tell you all about the local places around you. So this is one of the things where these, these four here is, I try to explain a lot is that the, the big thing about Web3 is it allows you to incentivize your community, right? You can create incentives to anyone and everyone. And um, these are all doing that, right? They have a token and they incentivize you to put a dash cam on your camera and that allows them to collect data and build a product around that, right? Um, or to use routers and put them in your, your, um, in your house, which normally someone wouldn't do. Like if I wasn't getting paid, I wouldn't go buy some random router and put it in my, my house um, or put a dash cam on, uh, on my dashboard. But because I'm incentivized to do it through a token structure, then it makes sense. And now you get the data, you get the users, you get people helping you build the product. The key thing they have to figure out is 
that's issuance, right? They have to give that money from their treasury or however they're doing it. Maybe it's some sort of mining way, whatever, like Bitcoin, but that goes out there. How do they get their revenues to make up for that? Because otherwise it's a Ponzi and it doesn't go anywhere, right? Because eventually they can't just continue to give out tokens for the remainder of life without bringing that revenue back in. It needs to be profitable. And I actually want to talk a lot about this. I think maybe we'll do it next week um, because the merge with Ethereum that's coming up, this is one of the best, most brilliant um, tokenomic structures. And when you understand what they're doing, it really helps you to understand all of these business models and what we're talking about from a different lens. And so uh, I'm going to talk a lot about that like next week because um, I think it's just super helpful for people to understand the business models uh, of these tokens. Yeah, no, it's a great point. Definitely something we'll dive into. Okay. What, what, what big news do we have here next, Kai? <laughs> this is actually super surprising, but super exciting. Uh, Elon Musk buys, I think it was like nine point, I don't know, whatever, 8% or something on Twitter. 9.2% yeah. of Twitter. And, uh, and as you can see from the tweet here from BlockWorks, he's also was appointed um, as the, the board of directors on Twitter. He is now the largest shareholder of Twitter. Now, this has nothing to do with crypto, um, but it has everything to do with crypto at the same time. Uh, and that's because a few things. One, Elon is obviously a, a uh, I don't know what, an influencer in, in the crypto yeah. space. Uh, yeah. Two, Twitter is where we all talk. <laughs> like that's where we all, most of you know us from, is from Twitter probably. Um, and that's just where crypto hangs out. And three, and I think more importantly, actually first let's go to the, the image for the viewers here watching. I like the next, the next tweet here. <laughs> Uh, it's just, it's the picture of Elon smoking a joint on the, on the Joe Rogan podcast. And it just says Twitter's next board meeting is going to be lit. But the best part is Elon was the one that tweeted out this image. <laughs> so good. He's just the best at trolling. He's the yeah. best on Twitter. And now he owns the most of Twitter. So I think that's super cool. Um, but, uh, what's really cool here is if we go to the next one, I, oh no, the next one's on Jack. So, um, you know, Twitter and, and really all social media companies have gotten a lot of flack lately for censoring content, right? We've seen it a lot with COVID. Um, there's things going on with the war with mm -hmm. Ukraine um, and just a bunch of different things. I mean, Donald Trump getting banned and um, and look, whether you agree, don't, don't agree with who is getting banned or who is getting um, censored. The thing is, the problem is, is that things are getting censored, right? We should have freedom of speech. We have freedom of speech in the real world. We don't have it on the internet. And that to me is bullshit. And I think that's one of the things that crypto fights for. We want freedom of the things we own digitally. We want freedom of the things that we say digitally. Um, and right now that doesn't exist in social media. Um, and Elon is a big proponent of freedom of speech. And so I, I don't know if this is why he did it. Um, but I, I think it's definitely something I feel like he's going to be a big proponent of and, and should push forward that, Hey, we need to stop censoring and let there be freedom of speech. And so I'm super pumped to have Elon running, well, not running Twitter, but at least have a say in Twitter, um, to help, to help push that forward. Because right now it's, it's a bunch of bullshit that's happening in social media. So yeah, I'm, I'm rooting for Elon here. Yeah. I, I gotta say, I just, I just really admire and am inspired by Elon constantly he's a bit of a he's a bit of a weirdo so i think sometimes people have trouble understanding him but he is an optimist to the highest right. degree that just is driven by the uh, the ambition to better humanity right, right. and right. make the world a better place and so uh, and i've heard him say that so many times one of my favorite elon quotes is uh i'd rather be an optimist and be wrong than be a pessimist and be right right yeah, that's a good quote so sort of funny, uh, this, this happened a few days before uh, Elon made this announcement, uh, but uh, Jack, who is the uh, initial founder of Twitter, uh, tweeted out um, that uh, the days of Usenet, IRC, and the web, even email, uh, were amazing. So the early um, web one days were amazing. Um, and then what happened was centralizing discovery and identity into corporations really damaged the internet. I realized I'm partially to blame and regret it. Uh, so a heavy tweet from Jack basically saying that the Web 2 period when we centralized uh, into five major corporations that own our data and the internet um, was a damaging cause damage and that he regrets it. I mean, uh, fascinating to hear him say that out loud, uh, that, you know, he clearly believes 
that we're going in a right direction now showing. You know, the problem is Jack's a hypocrite and I <laughs> complete hypocrite because he says this, which he's right. It did become, you know, centralized, whatever from web two. And yes, he was part of that. He built Twitter. Sure. But now that there's web three that's being built out, he bashes it and he's against it because it's not mm. on Bitcoin, his love and his, you right. know, the thing that he thinks about all day, all night, it's not on Bitcoin. And like he says that and he doesn't agree with Web3 right now because yes, there's still investment from VCs. It's not fully decentralized, blah, 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 whatever, Jack. Twitter was not what it is today, like 10 years ago either, right? Like it took time to develop and build it. It was a shit product back in the day until things got worked out and we figured mm. out how to make Twitter what it is today. And it's like, how are you not supporting Web3? You are this big proponent of decentralization yeah. and all this. And you put this tweet out, yet then you actually publicly, um, he publicly hates on Web3. And it's like, mm -hmm. it doesn't make any sense, man. Like, which, what do you support here? Do you support Web2 or do you support Web3? And I know he supports Web4 is kind of their thing. It's like when Web3 finally becomes decentralized, but it's like, so you're going to hate on it until then? Like, it just makes no sense. Just get out of here, Jack. Get off Twitter. And I don't want to hear a word from you anymore. You suck. I'm not gonna lie, you suck. Bitcoin getting Kai, getting Kai fired up over here. Well, <laughs> it's like which which side does he take here? Make up your mind. Um, <laughs> anyway, here's a nice one. Okay, so look, here's someone's actually doing something about this. Um, Jack, you're just tweeting and you know, kind of making shit up. Lens protocol um, is this is the future, in my opinion, of where social goes. Like social right now is 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 fully centralized. We don't own anything. It's it's a mess, right? Um, I mean, Facebook and Google uh, and Twitter, they make all the money. Uh, and the, those who are creating and doing things on it, we make basically nothing. Um, so Lens Protocol was actually invented uh, or created through Aave. Aave is one of the largest, most well-known um, decentralized finance uh, protocols in crypto. Started on, on Ethereum. It's actually now on Avalanche and on, I don't know, a bunch of different, a bunch of different blockchains. Um, and it's huge. It's, it's the best. And the, the founder of Aave is, is like one of the, the greatest in the space. So they actually brought together a team of big wigs from social media. I think it was, they got some people from Google, from Facebook, from, was it Reddit maybe? I think from Twitter as well. Um, and they, uh, and basically they launched um, something called Lens Protocol, which basically, as they call it here, is a permissionless composable and decentralized social graph that makes building a Web3 social platform easy. Um, so Lens Protocol is not the social platform. It's not the Twitter or the Facebook, but it is the new, um, it is the sort of the underlying technology that allows people to build the Twitter, the Facebook, the Reddit in a decentralized and permissionless way. Um, so it's technology that's needed to get the thing that we eventually want. Um, so it's really, really exciting. And it's honestly kind of hard to wrap your head around what exactly Lens Protocol is. I've read through their sites. I still don't know. I'm working on getting someone from their team on the podcast to, <laughs> to, to explain it to us. Um, but essentially, they're building the social graph where you can, um, what's really cool is if you actually want to go to the next tweet. Um, so here's an easier way to explain it. So they did a hackathon sort of thing recently. Uh, and the community created 100 different projects that could be built on Lens Protocol. And the reason this is cool is like, what we think of social media right now is not what it's going to be when this gets built out. It's going to be very different, I think. And the reason is because of this composability that Lens Protocol allows is we might have a, hundreds of social media platforms. And that sucks in the Web2 world because, well, you build on one and you don't have access to move your stuff to the other one, right? Because you don't own anything. You don't own your followers. You don't own your content. Um, so to, to be on multiple platforms is very difficult. In this world where it's all composable and interoperable, you could be building or, or using and creating on one and then just move your followers along with you and your content along with you to the next one and to the next one. It's very fluid, right? And so we might have a bunch of different ones and just like you can go and interact in any one you want. And as you do that, it builds up your social reputation. So you don't have to spend all your time on one platform. It could be a bunch of different platforms, some video, some written, some whatever we decide to do in the metaverse. Um, and they all will accumulate um, your reputation and your following and your, I don't know, whatever else we decide that is. Um, so you'll own all your content, you'll own your followers, um, and you'll own your profile as well. And so I think it's, 
it's kind of hard to imagine right now, but I would be following Lens Protocol and just paying attention to what they're doing uh, because I think this is the future of social. And maybe, maybe one day Elon sees this and he decides to, uh, to build Twitter on this as well. We'll see. I don't know. <laughs> Here's your prediction right there. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Composability is a big theme that has so much power in Web3. Uh, and it's a difficult concept to understand for us in the Web2 world because Web2 is not composable. Right. Yeah. You're building on closed platforms uh, where you can't layer on top of that and have open source and have other people come in and build. So um, it is it is difficult to think about, but it is exciting to think that we could take our followers from one platform to another or we could take our content from one platform to another. And that's really what the future of social holds. Right. And I mean, this is still, I mean, they're, they're not even on mainnet yet. Uh, they're building on Polygon, uh, but it's testnet. It's still going to be years until I think we have a solid Web3 decentralized social platform. So don't, don't expect this to happen anytime like soon. I mean, maybe something comes out of nowhere. I don't know, but that's just my opinion. Okay, next up, uh, we got another NFT collection that sold. The Pudgy Penguins NFT collection. Uh, sold their collection of 800, sorry, 8,888 digital penguins uh, for 750 ETH. And the reason, the reason we wanted to bring this up is, you know, we saw Board Ape Yacht Club uh, and um, their investor uh, round when they raised a whole bunch of money. And then we saw CryptoPunk sell to Yuga Labs. So we've seen this a few times. And one thing I think that I keep I keep hearing and people keep asking me is like, wait a second, like what, what, what is this? Like, what did they sell? Like, what did this person buy or what did this VC buy? Um, like, are they buying the NFTs? Like what, what is really part of the sale? So uh, Kyle, break this down for us. What, what did um, this investor buy by purchasing Pudgy Penguins? Yeah, so they didn't, they didn't actually buy in the NFTs. Like the, the owners of the NFTs still are the owners of the NFTs. That's one of the beautiful things about, uh, about Web3 and about crypto. Uh, and, and by the way, that 750, 750 ETH is like, it says 2.5 million uh, in, in US dollars. Um, so that's interesting. What they bought though was a few things. I mean, one, they bought a brand, right? Pudgy Penguins, uh, I mean, is somewhat popular in the NFT space. So they bought the brand of Pudgy Penguins that they can go and do things with. Um, they bought the community, right? So there's a Discord server somewhere. There's a community of people following their Twitter and in their Discord um, that are familiar with and like or love their Pudgy Penguins. Um, so they bought access to that community. Um, and then I don't know the details of it, but potentially they bought the IP. So it depends on who owns the IP, um, which is different for a lot of different NFTs. Um, but probably I would assume they also bought the IP, which then allows them to, I don't know, maybe Pudgy Penguins wants to create a TV show or a movie or I don't know, a metaverse and uh, or a game or something. And so they have the IP of that as well. So I mean, they bought a business. And I guess the other thing that they bought as well is um, there's royalties. So there's revenue here. When people buy and sell a pudgy penguin, there is some sort of royalty. I assume, again, I don't actually know what the royalty is for, for mm -hmm. pudgy penguins, um, but most of them have this where they get a certain percent of that sale. Um, and pudgy penguins are worth, you know, a few ETH. So mm -hmm. when they get a sale, they're, they're actually making a decent amount of money. So there's revenues that they also bought. So um, try to not think of this as they bought a, an NFT collection, they bought a business and a business that has a brand, it has users, it has revenue, it has a community. Um, and so that's, it could be a great purchase. We'll see. I mean, I don't, I don't know what pudgy penguins are or, or why people like penguins that are, that are fat, uh, but, but they're cute, I guess. And they're I know cute. Some people that, they're yeah, really I know cute. Some, yeah, they're cute. Um, but I mean, look, you could do things with this. You could make a comic, you could make a game, you could make a yeah. movie. And, and instead of making it from scratch, you already have a bit of a base, right? You have a bit of revenue to help. Um, you have a brand around it. You have a lot of things. There's a website, there's social. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's only, I mean, not only, but it's 2.5 million. I mean, I'm sure this guy, uh, Luca Nets, who bought it from, who's from LA, I'm sure he's got the, the means to buy this. You could do some cool things with it and we'll see what happens. I mean, look at what Yuga Labs has done um, with theirs, right? So um, yeah, it's interesting. It's, it's cool to see this sort of um, network effect now. This is continuing to happen. And I'm sure this won't be the last NFT collection we see that sells. Um, yeah. So 
we'll follow this and we'll see what, what comes of it. If they, if they have a plan or, or maybe they just wanted to buy it and collect those royalties, who knows? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What the, what I love that you said um, is that NFTs is really the intersection of brand and community. Mm, that's, right. that's really what NFTs are is, you know, you're building a brand and then you're also building a community that then these NFTs, that these, like the yeah. PFP yeah. collections. Yeah. Yeah. Specifically. yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, these 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 NFTs. Yeah, awesome. All right, well, let's shift gears now uh, to. There's so much happening on the regulatory level and government level uh, announcements coming out, uh, and often it's it's fun. Often it's uh it's not it's not the most exciting news because it's that it's the government trying to control uh, what we are trying to build, which is self sovereignty, right? So this was exciting news coming out of the UK because it was the opposite of that. So the government of the UK set, set out a plan to make the UK a global crypto asset technology hub. Uh, and I'm just going to highlight a couple of things in this announcement that what they're focused on. First is stable coins are to be brought within regulation, paving their way for use in the UK as recognized form of payment. Uh, there's an announcement uh, as part of this that measures to make the UK a global hub for crypto asset technology and investment. And so they're talking about how they're going to open their doors to more uh, investment and more technology, improving and pushing crypto forward. Uh, and then there's also talk about um, how they're going to create legislation uh, and they call it the financial market infrastructure sandbox. So they want innovation to happen. They want to create legislation which encourages innovation and basically creates a sandbox where um, crypto companies can play and can innovate without feeling the fear of potential regulation coming in the future. Uh, so, uh, and then they also, I don't even know what this means, but they also said they're going to Royal Mint an NFT, which I, uh, that feels like that's like some PR guy threw that in there. I don't, I don't even know what that means. But yeah, it's, uh, it's, I think it's great news. Uh, yeah, I think it's awesome. And I mean, we, we talked about this, I think, weeks and weeks ago, maybe months ago, uh, that when, when the US, we kind of weren't sure what they're going to do with their, their regulatory. We still don't really know. But for those who kind of block crypto and, and don't allow for innovation, the entrepreneurs, the businesses, the money, the people, they're going to go mm -hmm. elsewhere. Right. Yeah. We live in a world where it's very easy to move around. I mean, I'm in a different place every episode. <laughs> it's not <laughs> hard to go to different countries. Um, and, and I mean, crypto makes it even easier, right? Because you can bring your money and your, your ownership with you. Um, so look, here's what happened with the internet, right? Europe had really bad restrictions and bad laws and rules that they put in with the internet. And so everyone went to the US because the US was very favorable. Silicon Valley was born from this and it was one of the greatest moves any country's ever done in terms of like, bringing in capital, right? Like mm -hmm. I forget, I saw some stats on how much capital and investment that Silicon Valley brings um, versus like the rest of the world. And it's, it's insane how much they bring mm -hmm. in. Um, and the, Europe completely missed that, right? Because they just put in stupid regulations. So everyone went to the US. I don't even know any tech companies that come out of Europe. I don't know any. I couldn't name one, yeah. but I could name you a hundred that come from the US. Yep. And so those who get it, the governments who get it and the people in the space already, we get it. We know that this is the next thing. Crypto, Web3, this is the future. It's the future of finance. It's the future of the internet. Um, and those countries that have good regulation, allow people to innovate, they're going to get a lot of capital, a lot of smart entrepreneurs that are going to move there. Um, and so good on the UK for doing this. We'll see how they actually do it and like implement it. Um, but it's amazing. We need countries like this. And we don't have a lot of them yet um, that have actually said we're going to be very favorable. We have like El Salvador is, is very, yeah. very good. I think the Bahamas, I believe, is, is another really big one. That's where FTX um, yeah. put their um, head office. I think Singapore might be a pretty good one. Other than that, like yeah. I, I don't really know. Portugal might be one, but um, Mar Marshall, Marshall Islands in, uh, in the Caribbean, which is the one that has the legal entity for Dow okay. Incorporation. So yeah, right. there's a few, but there's really, there's not many. And I think you nailed it. When technology is, is on a growth path like it is now with new technology of blockchain and all these base layers, there is going to be some governments and some uh, places in the world that really support that. And that's where the innovation, the money is going to flow. Last year alone, 
there was over $30 billion in investment into crypto and Web3 projects. $30 billion. Well, that's got to go somewhere. And the UK is basically raising their hand and saying, come here. We want to be part of this revolution. I actually hope. I mean, I don't know if I hope this because it'd be very bad for the markets, but like if a lot of the big countries like of Europe and and US and whatever, like they have bad regulation and then a lot of the like developing countries like El Salvador and that and they all like, let's say throughout Latin America or something, they all allow it and everyone yeah. floods there. Shit, that'd be amazing. You got good weather. You got great surf, uh, good food. It's cheap. And everyone just goes there and starts building crypto companies. That would be my dream because I already live in Latin America anyway. Uh, so that would be amazing. But um yeah, I don't know. We'll see. It's, it's, it's very interesting. And one of the things I think that governments need to realize is like, look, as crypto and all this decentralized decentralization plays out, like they're not going to get the amount of money they want and like taxes and things like that, where they get their money. And because where they give, like governments need to think of like, they are a business as well. And so where do governments give value in the physical world? They give value. They don't give value in the digital world. Okay. So like get out of our way let us do what we're going to do in the digital world and in the metaverse and like with what we're doing here with, with web three, et cetera, get out of our way and focus on what you do, which is like build some roads, right? Make sure that our, 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 um, we have good infrastructure. We have water and we have all those things. That's what we pay your ta our taxes for. So like, if you want to get the crypto community, one, allow us to do the, whatever the hell we want to do, right? Let us innovate and build a better digital world. And you focus on building your physical world. And we will, like, if you are open to allowing us do what we want in the digital world, we will come and we will build our businesses. We still obviously need things in the physical world. We need roads. We need headquarters, right? We need, we need physical businesses. So we will come put them on your land, right? And you can serve us and you can do the things you want. We will pay our physical taxes to you then. But leave us alone in the digital world, in the metaverse. Let us do what we want because you're, you're just slowing us down and you, you don't provide any value. You actually do the opposite. So like you shouldn't be trying to taxes and shit in the, in, the, in the metaverse because you don't do anything there. It makes no sense, right? You run a business, go do something good in the physical world and give good roads to us and good water and good whatever. And hey, we'll come there and we'll pay those. That's what I think governments need to check themselves and, and, and that'll help, but we'll see what happens. Uh, Kyle, Reed, Kyle Reed head for president. <laughs> Hell no. I, uh, <laughs> I'd, just, I'd, be, I'd be pissed every day if I was involved in politics, I think. <laughs> well, uh, and, and you, you bring up you know, such, such a great point, uh, which maybe is a little overly simplified, but it's true. Right. Uh, but here's, here's the issue, and this sort of transitions nicely into our next story here, which is uh, some some legislation coming out of the EU, uh, but the issue, <laughs> what's that? Europe doing it, doing it again. Doing it again, doing it again. Yeah. But here's the issue though. The issue is a lot of governments focus on, well, my job is to protect and to secure. And they also, a lot of their campaigns, a lot of politicians run off of the creation of fear, right? And so they create fear and then that allows them power. That gives them power because people are afraid and they say, oh, protect me. I don't understand this stuff, right? Uh, so you can see that cycle. Um, and here, here's what's happened is European Parliament is, uh, it, they're they haven't passed this bill. I don't quite understand the steps it has to go through. It is almost passed. Basically, it passed a bill um, requiring crypto firms to KYC non-custodial wallets uh so kyle break break down for us what this means to the users yeah so they so governments can't do anything to non-custodial wallets themselves like they can't make metamask kyc its users or you know exodus or whatever the things that we use in web3 they don't have any control because those are decentralized um for the most part, some of them probably say they are and they're, they're actually not. But anyway, um, you get the idea. They don't have any user data. They can't like force anything or freeze any assets or anything like that. Um, they don't even know who's using their, 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 their protocol and their wallets. Um, but what, what um, governments can do is they can put regulations on the crypto firms, meaning like the crypto exchanges, because those mm -hmm. are physical businesses in X country that have corporations and like they're controlled the normal way. Just because they hold crypto assets doesn't mean they're a crypto or decentralized company. They're just a normal business. They just happen to be in the crypto space. So what they've done is they're saying that if you want to send money out of your 
your account at, I don't know, crypto.com or Coinbase or whatever, you and you want to send it to a non-custodial wallet, they can't do anything to that, to that wallet. But what they can do is say, who is that wallet that you're going to, that you're sending it to? And they can force you before it can leave the decentralized exchange to put in the name and the address or the email or whatever information they want, the KYC. And that's basically what they're trying to do. So, hey, if you want to move from a centralized exchange and go into that decentralized world, the world that we all love, well, we want to know what's that wallet you're sending it to first. And now like there's a, there's, well, we'll let you give your quote and then I can talk about kind of how this might play out, but go for it. Yeah, so uh, this is a quote from Brian Armstrong, the CEO of Coinbase. Uh, and basically he said, imagine if the EU required your bank to report you to the authorities every time you paid your rent merely because the transaction was over 1,000 euros. And that's basically what this is doing is right. that's the limit. Any transaction over 1,000 euros, uh, they're going to force you to report that to the authorities. Uh, so, I mean, you could just, the, the implications of it, I mean, it's just, it's pure shake head. What are you doing? Uh, but the implications of this are, are far and wide in terms of, I mean, the amount of data they're going to have to store the potential for hackers to get all that data. Cause now they're going to have all this data somewhere of the, all this KYC data hackers are going to love that. And then also the, the burden of this, like this is a huge burden. Right. Well, now you have these companies that have to go and build in the capabilities for this, which is insanity as is. Yeah. And now think about the users who are like, I just want to go and use my, play my game or do whatever it is in Web3. Now I have to like fill out this form or complete this thing yeah. to send it. And like, we all, we usually have multiple wallets. Like now you got to do it for every single one. Um, but I mean, what's going to happen is like, look, I, I have five, I don't know how many wallets I have, like, like actual non-custodial ones, I have a bunch of them. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to send it to that, that one wallet where I can put in whatever address I need or whatever. And I'm going to put it there and that's going to be my burner wallet. I'm just going to put it to there and now I'm going to send it out to other wallets. You know what I mean? Because once I'm in, I don't have to do that again. They, don't, it's, they can't force me to do it to every wallet. So I'll just send it all to one wallet and then I can just distribute to other wallets. Um, so, but it's also not really needed. Like I'm already, they have me KYC'd in the centralized exchange. Why do you need yeah. to know where it goes after that? Like, if there's something was done wrong, you can just track on chain, like even without any of this, like, you know who I am on Coinbase, right? I send to X MetaMask wallet. You already can see that on chain. So like, what yeah. do you need this extra step for? Just go look on chain and you, it's actually perfect for you. If you're worried about, I don't know what they're worried about here, like um, laundering money or, yeah. or terrorism. It's like funding terrorism. It's just like, just go look on chain. You already see it. You don't need that. Um, so what they're trying to do doesn't, won't work. And it's just, like you said, it's a burden for the companies and for the users. So, um, shame on you, Europe. You did it again. Uh, please, please, please. The U S when you come out with your stuff end of this year, please be good. Uh, don't do this. So stupid. <laughs> uh, so talking about the U S Miami this week is popping off, uh, with, uh, <laughs> Bitcoin 2022, uh, neither Kyle or I are there, obviously, but I've spoken to a couple people who are, as I'm sure you have as well. Uh, Kai, what have you heard coming out of coming out of Bitcoin 2022? Uh, you know, I haven't heard anything. I don't really know like a lot of people that go to this. Like, here's the here's the thing about Bitcoin is like they're not there's nothing being built on Bitcoin, right? <laughs> there's nothing. No one's doing anything. There's no apps. There's no devs. Like, it's just Bitcoin is what it is. It's a store of value. We get it. It's great. I love Bitcoin, so I'm not bashing Bitcoin anyway. I think Bitcoin is amazing, and it's going to be uh, play a huge part in in the future of of our world. But like, um, I don't know what they talk about at these things. Like, how many days is this? It's like four or five days. Like, yeah. what are we talking about? Once you're like, once you get Bitcoin, it's like, what's left, right? Um, so I have no idea. But look at the speakers. It's like Odell Beckham Jr. Uh, yeah, Aaron Aaron Rodgers, uh, <laughs> Jordan Peterson. Uh, like, is this, is this pre president Naive Bukele? Is that the president of El Salvador? Yeah. Yeah. So that's cool. Yeah. Like to hear how that's, it's impacting, yeah. to hear how it's impacting El Salvador. That, that is cool. Cynthia Lumens is also, um, she's the one yeah. that's doing a lot for regulation in Wyoming and she's a Senator. I don't know what she is, but she's senator. something in politics. Yeah, so like, okay, there's a couple things that are cool. And, and I think, yes, let's, let's talk about the direction of Bitcoin. Um, but a lot of it, like I remember last year, just kind of watching videos, it was just like, it almost felt like a religious yeah, I was gonna say. Uh, conference where it's just like, 
hoorah and let's get pumped up and hope the price goes up. So like, I don't know. Um, I don't see any reason to attend these events, um, but there are some cool stuff. Like I think hearing from Naive is amazing. Hearing from Michael Saylor is amazing. Um, and like getting some updates on what's going on with Lightning Network is cool. Um, just don't really know what else they talk about, but I've never mm -hmm. been, so maybe I'm missing something. I think, uh, I think you make a good point. And that's, again, goes back to what we talked about, about the external view of the crypto space and the Web3 space. Right. In a lot of ways, this, you know, this conference is actually pushing that because it does feel religious from the outside, yeah. which is what scares people, right? Last year was super cringe, some of the videos coming out of it. Let's hope this year is, um, is just better. Let's hope so. Okay, uh, we're going to final wrap up with our DAO of the month. Uh, so give me a little drum roll here. Uh, our DAO of the month is... MakerDAO. Everyone's like, what? MakerDAO? That's boring. <laughs> but I, the reason we went with MakerDAO um, is because... There is a lot of DAOs that have popped up in the last, I don't know, whatever it's been, year or so. Um, and a lot of them kind of suck. Like just, I think it's just a lot of them don't have direction or don't really yeah. know what they're doing. And they have cool ideas. Um, like, so like oh. the intention is there, yeah. um, but the actual implementation of it is just like, it didn't really go so well. Um, and we see that with a lot of DAOs. And so the reason we brought up MakerDAO is, um, MakerDAO has been around for forever. I don't know when it started. It was like 20... 2016. I mean, their Twitter started April 2015, but there's no way that's when it was. This must be, they must have changed an account name or something. I don't know. Well, no, it is called MakerDAO. So I, I don't know when it was, but so let's just give a bit of a background story here. So MakerDAO is um, basically, they are the almost like central bank for Ethereum. So MakerDAO is where you can go and you can give collateral. So ETH or USDC or I don't know, wrapped Bitcoin, whatever you want. You can give some collateral and they'll give you DAI, which is a, a decentralized um, stable coin. And then you can go and do things with that. You can use it in DeFi. You can, I don't know, transfer it into like US dollars and buy whatever you want with it. Um, so it's, it's a lending platform essentially where you, you put up collateral and it gives you and mints these new like DAI tokens. It's one of the biggest decentralized um, stable coins in the space. And it's kind of the OG. It was one of the first um, actual applications to be built on Ethereum years and years and years ago. Um, so it was kind of the like aha moment that like, whoa, we can make actual apps that work and do mm -hmm. things. And DAI has been stable for many, many years. It's probably the most battle tested of any of these decentralized stable coins. Um, and it's just, it's worked, it's worked for forever and it's got all this utility. Um, so they've done a great job product wise. Now, the reason we brought this up is they have been a DAO for many, many years. I, I honestly think it's 2016, maybe it's 2017, but I think, I think it's before yeah, that. I think it's 2016. Yeah. And this DAO has just been like, it's one of the longest standing DAOs by far. Um, they, this DAO has built this amazing product in, in what maker DAO is and in what DAI is. Um, it's multi-billion dollars of market cap and it's all been basically built or at least maybe it wasn't fully built by the DAO, but it's been managed um, by this DAO for many years. And this, this product has just continued to flourish and do better. Now, yes, there's, there's other stable coins that have had more growth recently, like UST with um, on Terra Luna. Um, but overall, like it's been steady growth and just like a, um, a strong stable coin, which we haven't had a lot of. Um, so they've built an amazing product. Um, now I want to dive deeper into the DAO and the structure of it. I don't know if there's anything you want to add first though, Jay. Uh, no, I think that like the thing that I just want to add and why we picked maker DAO, uh, is because they truly are a fully decentralized right. organization. And I think a lot of DAO is a hot word right now. It's the, you know, it's the bee's knees. Everybody's starting a DAO. Uh, but not a lot of people understand what that means or how to do that. And so that's why you have a lot of projects that are going nowhere because it's very difficult to operate decentralized. Uh, right. And MakerDAO is fully decentralized. MakerDAO also it has no legal entity, uh, which is also very interesting. Not many DAOs truly have no legal entity. Most right. are forced to go figure that out, but 
maker is yet yeah, fully fully decentralized i th- i think one of the reasons why this dao has lasted so long is they have a great product mm-hmm. they have a yeah. great product that the members of their of the dao use in need yeah. right because um th- the way that their dao is set up is like it- it's quite big let's say um but it's actually not just a bunch of individual users like we're used to in daos today it's actually like companies or agencies and or like groups of people mm-hmm. who use DAI and who use uh, MakerDAO and they want they want to use it in different ways and they want to have different um, uh, capabilities of it. So what they do is they're like, oh, I use MakerDAO for this, right? And I use DAI for this, but I want to use it for this way. So what they do is their company puts out a proposal to MakerDAO, the, the, the entire community and says, we want to build this feature we'll take this much from the treasury so we can build it. The reason we want to build it is because we want to use it. And I'm sure many of you do as well. And then the gov- then the, the community votes and the community is often a lot of different companies, agencies, whatever, others that are building on it. And they vote and go, yeah, that's a good idea. We need that. Here's the funding. And they go and build it. So now you have like the users making money to make the product that they're using even better. Um, and so some of the examples is you want to go to the next one. Um, I think it's an example here. Yeah. So um this 6S Capital. Um, so this is the, the, I believe it's the founder of 6S Capital has just been a member of, of MakerDAO for, for many years. And he's just been kind of watching. And what he does is he helps companies um, fund like physical, uh, like buildings and things like that. So like Tesla, for example, wanted to, I forget what they're creating. They're creating um, warehouses for something. They're going to build another thing, but they didn't want to go and buy a bunch of these warehouses around the world because it puts debt on their balance sheet, which is bad for, in, for investors and their public company. So what they can do instead is 6S Capital can go and build those warehouses and they can do it. And then Tesla just pays them rent. And now it's not a liability, right? Um, and they can like sign a deal to pay future rent for the next however many years. And so this guy who was in MakerDAO was like, wait, I, Tesla's trying to build these things, um, but they need funding. So he's like, I could get the funding from MakerDAO with, with DAI um, and I could fund this you know, project for Tesla. And so that's exactly what he did. He put in some proposals, they made a way to make this happen and boom, now he's funding a bunch of warehouses for Tesla through MakerDAO. So what's actually happening is Tesla is using DAI to buy warehouses to build their products, which is super cool, number one. But it just, it came from the community. Um, other things that happen is like there's devs and there's dev communities inside MakerDAO where they were like, oh, we should put MakerDAO on layer twos where there would be no fees to use DAI. And so they put out a proposal and boom, they're doing it. Now they're getting built across Optimism and Arbitrum. Uh, I think maybe Polygon, I'm not sure. Um, but that's just happening from within the DAO because they're like, I use this. I would love to use this without fees. And so it's all, it's this like really cool DAO with a big community of like big companies, let's say, that just want to make this product better. And that's really what a DAO is. It's very decentralized and it's just the users are like, oh, I want, I think we should do this feature. And they just put a proposal and they go and do it. And MakerDAO, yes, it's not the best thing in the world. There are its challenges, right? It can be slow. It's very, um, what do you call it? Is it democratic is the word where it's just like, it takes a while to figure yeah. out things because there's a lot of voting and stuff. So it's not perfect by any means. Um, but it's robust. And like Jay said, it is truly decentralized for the most part. Um, and it's bigger than just this like discord community of a few people that are yeah. like trying to come up with something. So um, the reason why I bring it up is like, why we bring it up is if you want to learn how to create a DAO and you're thinking long-term about your DAO, not just trying to like get some capital and rug it, join MakerDAO. You can join mm-hmm. their discord and just watch what they're doing or follow them on Twitter because they're, they're doing big things and it's all happening in this like decentralized fashion. You could yeah. also go look at, and really maybe we should have said the DAO of the month is all of the, um, all of the like OG DAOs from before DAOs mm-hmm. were even cool. Like Compound is another good one. This yeah. is like a product that was built on top of DAI. So actually built on top of this product here, they have their own DAO that does things with it. Um, there's like, um, what are the other big ones? I think Uniswap is one. Mm-hmm. Um, I think Yearn has a big one. Yeah. Uh, just look for the blue chips in the DeFi space because these are the protocols that were first built was the DeFi ones. And they just have these very long standing big DAOs that are that are doing like, it's actually a real business and they're, they're building products with it and they're billion dollar products. So um, it's really cool to dive into that. 
If you want to learn more, I'd highly recommend the Bankless podcast that just came out last week. Um, and it was with two, three, three of the members of MakerDAO. And it broke down the product. It broke down the structure of the DAO, the tokenomics. Um, really, really good deep dive and like look into, into MakerDAO. Shout out MakerDAO. Everybody, <laughs> go, go yeah. check it out. Yeah, lots, lots to learn. Uh, well, uh, and it, which is a great reminder. That's, that's always the great place to learn from. You want to learn how a new structure, a new technology is working, go find the OGs, uh, which often are the quiet ones. They're right. hanging out in the background, uh, building and doing great work. But one thing that's, you know, MakerDAO, we hear lots about DAI, but MakerDAO is not, they don't have a press team. They're not doing marketing. They're not trying to draw attention to themselves, which is part of their strategy. Their focus is build DAI, make DAI a global currency and a leading global currency, and then MakerDAO, that's their focus. So, but they're, they're, they're under the radar doing a lot of really good things. And yeah, I think structure wise, I listening to that podcast, I learned a lot. Yeah. I mean, it's about the product, right? You just build the product because that's the thing is with Web3 and what we're building here is like, the, these are new products that people need all around the world. The amount of people that can use lending and borrowing is massive and use it without permission. Just go and do it whenever you want. It's huge. So like they're solving a massive problem and they've built a great robust product and hell yeah, a lot of people are going to use this. Um, and so it's cool to see it being run by a DAO though. And I think that's, that's the interesting part here. Well, that's a wrap. Thanks all for listening. Uh, thanks for being part of uh, the podcast. Uh, as always, uh, if you're not already in the Web3 Academy Discord server, please join us in there. Uh, we're up over 200 people now, people joining every day. Uh, we have a weekly meetup uh, where we welcome new members every Monday. We want to meet you. We want to talk about what you're doing in Web3. We want to teach you about Web3. Uh, we've got builders. We've got creators. We've got business leaders. We've got marketers in the community. Tons of great conversation. would love to see you there. And uh, Jeremy actually just restructured all of the channels inside of our Discord. So we have spots to discuss different things like NFTs or metaverse or tokens or marketing mm -hmm. specifically. Um, we've just got a lot more... I think it's organized in a much better way. There's a lot of action in there now as more people have been joining. So if you haven't been in it in a while, come check it out. It's fun. We've got a gratitude section, which I love. And actually mm -hmm. I wasn't sure of, but it's like the most popular channel we have in Discord right now. Everyone's yeah. just giving their gratitude every day and I love it. Um, so yeah, check it out. It's fun. And we want, to, we want to hear from you. Yeah, yeah. Lots of exciting things. Everybody have a great weekend. Uh, and uh, yeah, keep on smiling. Keep on practicing your gratitude. We love you all. Let's make the world a better place. Take care. Thank you for listening to Web3 Academy. We hope this helps you along your Web3 journey. And if it does, please share this episode and subscribe so you don't miss the next one. By the way, if you have yet to join the Discord community, you are missing out. This is where all the magic happens. This is where we learn, where we ask questions, where we network. Uh, you want to be in there. The link to join is in the description below. And finally, a quick disclaimer. Nothing in this podcast was financial advice. Crypto and Web3 can be risky. You can literally lose it all. In fact, if you invest on account of what we say, you probably will lose it all. So don't do that. In all honesty, the point of this podcast is to remove the noise of markets and price and focus on utility and implementation anyway. So you should not take any of this as financial advice. Thank you, friends, and see you in the next one.